Good evening. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for Strategic International Studies. Uh, my name is Andrew Schwartz. I'm our Senior Vice President for External Relations, and I'm standing in for my boss, John Hamry, who really helped us frame this session, which is going to be really excellent tonight. I want to thank our partners, uh, Texas Christian University, TCU, and thank all of our guest panelists for being here. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it to uh, my good friend, Bob Schieffer. Thank you very much. And uh, on behalf of uh, TCU and the Schieffer School of Journalism, we're going to talk about, and this seems a little bit loud to me, <laughs> does it? Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about today about the Arab Spring. And we have a great panel, uh, Nancy Youssef, uh, McClatchy News Service's Pentagon correspondent, uh, first member of her family to be born in America. She is of Egyptian uh, heritage. And so she knows a whole lot about this part of the world. And she also knows a little bit about Afghanistan and Iraq, where she spent a lot of time uh, in recent years. John Alterman from here at CSIS, uh, one of our outstanding scholars, uh, also a former State Department official, PhD, taught at Harvard, made all the stops that one needs to make to become a, an expert in uh, Mideast uh, policy. And David Ignatius, who just knows everything about everything. I'll just, <laughs> I'll just say about David. Washington Post used to be the foreign editor there, had a lot of key uh, positions there. Uh, and then, uh, of course, now we all know him twice a week. Uh, he writes his uh, column on the, uh, the uh, op-ed page. Well, let's just start. Uh, Nancy, uh, you're just back from over there. Uh, let's just go around the horn uh, in the Middle East right now. Uh, what's happening there? What are, why don't we start with uh, Libya? What's the latest news there? Well, Libya is where I spent the most time. I was there for three months up until last month covering the rebel side. So um, Benghazi and as far west as they got, I, I, we got as far as Benjawad um, with them. And, uh, and frankly, Libya right now is, is in a bit of a stalemate because on one hand, you've got these rebels who didn't really anticipate the fight that they now find themselves in. They, they, they saw what happened in Egypt and Tunisia and said, as one Libyan put it to me, we saw these Egyptians all mad at Mubarak. And we thought, really, we thought he was pretty good compared to Gaddafi, so we better rise up. <laughs> so they did and thought it would take a few days. And now they find themselves in a protracted conflict. Um, many of these guys don't know how to fight, have never had a weapon. And Gaddafi purposely um, didn't keep his major military installations in that area because it's, it's sort of home of rebellion for Libya. And on the other side, you've got Gaddafi forces, um, some of them mercenaries, some of them forced to fight, some of them loyal to Gaddafi. And, and neither side has been really able to overtake the other. Um, and so you've got both sides sort of standing back and regrouping in, in some cases and, 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 and fighting, um, fighting when they can. You'll see that battle most often in Misrata, which is Libya's third biggest city. Um, and meanwhile, you've got an international community that's wrestling with its, its its role in all this and whether it, it's handled it the right way. I think as much as the rebels didn't expect it would go this long, the, the same could be said for NATO and certainly for the United States. Um, so so we're, we're, we're stuck in a sense. We don't, uh, I think um, my impression after I left there is I think people think this will end militarily and, I, and ultimately I don't think that's the case. I think this will end financially. I think it will take Gaddafi running out of money to bring this true, to a true end given, given those military um, issues at hand for, for, for both sides. Um, Where is Gaddafi? Do we know? He was playing chess last we saw and uh, released video to show that everything was fine. He's bunkered down somewhere uh, in Tripoli. He's refused to leave Libya. Um, and um, that's about the extent of it. I mean, he, he has, the, you know, there was only, there's 12 major military compounds in Tripoli, so he has a lot of places to choose from. It seems NATO's hit most of them. So he, we've heard he's hidden with relatives, that he's moving from place to place. Um, but he, he assures um, he, members of the Jumhuria, which is what he calls his state, that, that, uh, that all is well and he's large and in, and in charge. David, how long uh, are we going to be there? And what are our options now? What do you see happening? Well, when we say we, we mean NATO, uh, supplemented by parts of the Arab League. Um, it's a, a coalition that uh, you'd have to say has not been as effective in use of military force as many people expected. And so one lesson some draw is that 
if the United States holds back, as we have been doing from the military action since the first week, uh, coalition won't, won't function effectively. Um, I'd agree with Nancy that this seems to be heading toward a stalemate. Um, there are worse things in the world than a stalemate. Uh, and if you ended up with a de facto ceasefire, uh, as in Lebanon after the worst fighting of the Civil War, as we know, uh, nations come back together sometimes after, uh, after delay. In the last week, I've had the opportunity to meet several times with a person who claims to be, and I think is, an emissary in contact with the chief of Libyan intelligence, uh, Abdullah al Sanusi, uh, who is uh, trying to interest U.S. officials in a, a dialogue that would produce some sort of discussion about a transition in which elements of the Gaddafi regime, but not Gaddafi, would join with uh, elements of the Transitional National Council, uh, the rebel group in Benghazi that we, in effect, have recognized, uh, with the idea of, of uh, putting together a coalition government that could pull this together before you get to, this, to, to the stage of much uh, worse violence. And I think that's an interesting option. Uh, my sense is that the, that the State Department has a, a, an appropriate skepticism for now about any of uh, what I must say have been, I gather, a number of emissaries claiming to speak for this one or that one. Uh, but um, as Nancy said, the, the White House, if you push the White House about this from the beginning, what they said was, in the end, this regime will implode because it will run out of money. It's a machine that runs on the money that it uses to bribe the tribes, bribe the mercenaries. That's how it operates. Uh, unfortunately, my information is that he's got more money in the country than people initially thought. The estimates that I've heard run as, as high as $10 billion in liquid money that he can get a hold of, um, more or less close to Tripoli. So if that's the case, uh, the TNC, the rebels, may run out of money before he does. Right. Well, what uh, is the Congress going to uh, allow us to continue there? I mean, is there going to have to be a vote under the War Powers Act? Where do you see all this? You know, Bob, I'm not the best person. I haven't been covering the, the, the congressional side as, as well as I, as I should have. The administration um, thinks that it can duck it. And uh, interestingly, the liberal wing of the administration is the part that most strongly wants to avoid a war powers vote uh, so that the principle can be established that in the case of humanitarian interventions, which is what if Samantha Power were sitting here, she'd say this is, um, that you don't have to go to Congress for war powers authority so that when the next Rwanda happens or the next Darfur, we can, we can do something uh, to intervene militarily without calling it a war. Uh, that's part of the, one of the weird aspects of this debate, but I honestly couldn't tell you what the strategy is. John, what do you, do you think we move too fast on Libya? Do we get into something here uh, when, you know, before we understood what it was? I mean, you know, I, I keep hearing this, you use the word implode. I've heard people say, you know, that uh, as far as U.S. security and what matters out in that part of the world, that Libya implodes, Egypt, for example, explodes. Do uh, you think on balance and, and on reflection now that we were wise to become involved there as quickly as we did? Um, th there was a window when we had to make a decision. We had, we had a fisher cut bait decision that would have been, I think, a fisher cut bait decision for, for the world. And our decision was to go in. I think we did not do as much as we should have and have not done as much as we need to to figure out how this ends. The, post-conflict environment in Libya is terribly important. And in, Libya ends up being at the interstices of a, of a large group of different interests. On the US military side, you're right between AFRICOM, CENTCOM, and UCOM. It is between the United States and NATO. It is between civilian and military control because we don't have troops on the ground. And I think one of the problems that we are having is, is 
nobody wants to lift up their head and say, this is what has to be done for the post-conflict environment for fear that everybody will say, OK, you do that and you pay for it. The consequence of that is that all the things we know about the importance of the post-conflict environment that we had forgotten before Iraq, we seem to be forgetting again. And it's, it's, a, weird, it's a weird situation because we do have Iraq and Afghanistan so clearly in our mind. But because it does fit into this seam between the US and NATO, because of our uh, uh, budget situation, because of the politics, it feels to me like this is falling precisely into a crack. And I'm very worried that if there were a sudden shift, that nobody is in a position to do much. In many ways, the worst thing that could happen <clears throat> were if an errant were targeted bomb, took out Muammar Gaddafi tonight, we are not ready and nobody is ready to begin to have any positive impact on the post-Gaddafi environment and with things spiraling out of control. You could have a whole set of terrorist threats coming out of there. You could have much more uh, a, a genocidal situation than anybody ever predicted for Benghazi when we got in the first place. I mean, this could really spin off badly and nobody is positioned to do anything to influence it in another direction. Can I add to that um, in terms of how we got in? Because the feeling on the ground was that there were a lot of wrong assumptions made going in. There was an assumption that if, if, if Gaddafi lost his air power, that the rebels would be able to end this. And then that didn't happen. And there were an, then there was the assumption that if major defections happened, that, that that would lead to the collapse of the regime. There were defections happened, but it, the regime still stood. And I think it was that underlying presumption that it would be easy and that the threat was imminent in terms of the attack on Benghazi that sort of started this. And it was interesting because when we would hear that, that Gaddafi, if he lost his air power, that would be the end of it, you could see Gaddafi's regime trying to avoid or stop the world community from getting involved and actually limiting its use of, of, of its air power for that reason. We were in, um, gosh, I can't remember what city anymore. We were in Brega, which is an oil town. and. Um, and there was an airstrike, and it was within a few hundred yards of us. I mean, it, I'm, a milita I'm around milita the military to know that they could have very easily struck us, and it was clear that they were purposely avoiding us to sort of create the threat of an air power without actually using it for the purpose of keeping the world community out. So I think there's this, this assumption going forward that, that if you just got rid of this, if you, if you, if you just stopped the air power, that the dominoes would fall quickly, and, and, that, and that hasn't happened. Anybody else want to say anything about Libya? Or I just kind of want to move across the uh, region here. No, you know, I, I'm, I'm struck by the uh, lack of enthusiasm of this administration for um, doing much more. Uh, I think there is there's some agitation in Europe, certainly, um, from some, uh, I suppose John McCain would like to see us um, play a larger military role. I see no enthusiasm for that at the White House, none. In, in Libya? In Libya. In Libya. I just wanted to add one little thing, if I could. I, the, from my time there, I think the question going forward, we have, as a nation, asked ourselves, but certainly something that struck me was, I oscillated between two extremes. There were times I felt like maybe we had done the wrong thing because we gave these rebels a false hope that, that, that the international community was coming, that their revolution was going <coughs> to take forth, and that, that change was on its way. And, and in fact, it may be the very genocide that we fear that could happen. And on the other extreme, there are moments where I was really happy that the world community got involved because I think Libya, more than any other country in a way, offers the most hope for true revolutions. You know, in Egypt and in Tunisia, the dictatorships, the dictators are gone, but not the dictatorship. Where in Libya, if Gaddafi falls, everything has to be rebuilt. Everything does because everything hinges on him. And so Libya offers this interesting dilemma, really, about whether what we've done is actually going to lead to real reform or really create the, the worst kind of stalemate in the sense that it, it will prolong the Libyan, the rebels, and, and the civilians living in eastern Libya prolong their suffering. So why is Syria different from Libya? Why, if uh, we found it necessary uh, to put together this uh, coalition and so forth to try to take down Gaddafi, why, why do we do everything from outside the borders uh, in Syria? I think part of it is because the neighbors have had a st strikingly different attitude and certainly had a very, very different attitude at the beginning. Uh, certainly in the initial days, all of Syria's neighbors preferred to 
keep a weak Assad rather than push him out. They feared that a, a collapsing Syria would explode through the region. There is such a deep hatred, especially among the Gulf Arabs, toward Muammar Gaddafi for all the antics he's pulled for trying to assassinate uh, now King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia in 2003. There has been a, a long series of offenses which led the Gulf Arabs to say, take him out. And I think that when you looked at the decision, it was a key determinant that the administration kept talking about, we have Arab support to do this. There simply isn't Arab support to push Bashar al-Assad out from power. I think there's increasing discomfort with him, but there's also a sense that many Arab leaders have that, you know, a, a cornered Bashar al-Assad is dangerous. Let's not quarter him too much. Let's not press him too much. And because the neighbors have such a different attitude, I think it changes not only what we do, but it changes what we can do. Well, what is the Israeli view toward Assad? I think the Israeli view had been initially. Uh, it's better to have a weak uh, Bashar al-Assad who is easy to intimidate. We know how to push his buttons. We don't have to teach him uh, what we can do. So we'll just keep him in his box because if you either have Sunni extremists taking over the state or you have the state falling apart and, and people can't control what radical groups do, all those things are worse than somebody who, when push comes to shove, you fly the jets low over the palace, they break the windows with the sonic booms, and he stops misbehaving. As far as the Israelis are concerned, that works pretty well. Um, and when they need to intimidate Assad, they know how to intimidate Assad. I think that the Israelis are becoming a little more on the fence as to what's really in their long-term interest, how sustainable is this, what's the consequence of a long-term thing going on. I think one of the mistakes, if, if we look more broadly in the region, that, that we're consistently making is we got really spoiled by the speed of Tunisia and Egypt. And I think a lot of these changes, to the extent they lead to changes, are going to take place over multiple years. There are going to be multiple rounds. And I think what we're looking at, not only in Syria, but especially in Syria, is something that will take years to, to, to play itself out, not weeks, not days. David, what, what's your take on that and what John just said? Well, I, I, I thought uh, John gave a good summary of the situation. Uh, Syria is um, one of the Arab countries, but I, I sometimes think uh, they all are in this category, uh, a country that, that breaks your heart. It's a, a country that has such richness of culture, um, such a, so many intellectually gifted people. Um, and, and in the time that I've been, in, been visiting, covering it, going back to 1980, 81, um, it's, it's had just a terribly corrupt uh, dictatorial regime sitting on this, on this wonderful co country. Bashar al-Assad has uh, said to many visitors, members of Congress, members of American Jewish groups, journalists like me, um, that he understands that his country desperately needs reform, that the Ba'ath Party is exhausted, corrupt, broken, uh, that he knows, he, he knows what he needs to do, and he's, by golly, he's going to do it. And so, you know, then he goes on the record and says exactly what his father would have said. And it's a very frustrating process with him. And I think that um, uh, people uh, in the U.S. pretty much have given up on, on his ability and maybe his, his serious desire to, to change the country. Um, that said, uh, I think we all, after Iraq, uh, are rightly nervous about processes that just kick out the pegs that support um, uh, the complex set of things that maintain order in a country. And um, Syria is a country where the, the, the tension between um, Sunnis and Alawis is palpable. Uh, it's been true, again, since I first, first went there. Um, you've had a, an Alawite minority since, I think, 1970. Two, I, somebody would, could correct me on this, 70. governing. Um, and so the chance for real ethnic violence is, is, is substantial. 
I think about Syria as I think about Libya, that this is, uh, uh, these are countries where um, creative di diplomats from the Arab world, from the United States, from Europe, should think carefully, and from Russia, I should under underline, should think carefully about how you would create an inclusive process of transition that keeps uh, bloodshed at a minimum as you go into this period of democratic change. I think that's the, truly, that's the challenge of right now, is to think about that question. And I wish, I wish there was more being done in, in this country about it. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, the, the, this could blow wide apart with really large loss of life, and it's important to, to well, think about it. there's already been a large loss of life. Well, in Syria, it's been, you know, I mean, not compared to what it could be. Yeah. I mean, yes, but, uh, but I mean, if, if it really got going, it would be thousands, tens of thousands. Nancy, let's, uh, let's talk about Egypt. What exactly is the state of Egypt right now? Well, the military is in charge of the country, and they really don't want to be. Uh, they, 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 they don't want to take on the economic problems that come with the responsibility of the country, and there's an effort by, by the military commanders to um, hold elections as soon as possible so that they can begin the process of handing over the, the, the sort of political and economic responsibility to, back to civilian leadership. I, I use that term loosely because the truth is Egypt's always been run by the military, but now it's, now it's you know, Minister Tentawi who's actually in charge, so there's no one to sort of forced to deal with the responsibility or the reaction of the people. Um, and we're starting to see early signs of um, efforts at forming political parties in anticipation of that um, election. But we're also starting to see frustrations with people who had thought that this would lead to major reforms and aren't quite seen it yet, and, and remnants of the old, the old regime, if you will, and the police state and all that, all that comes with it. On top of that, food prices are up in Egypt and have been since the revolution, and, we're, and I was just in Egypt two weeks ago, and you can, the, the frustration over that is quite palpable. So all of those sort of pieces are moving um, at, at the same time, um, and, and, and the result is a, a real sense of uncertainty about the way ahead, but so far, no hope of this, the, the major reforms that, that we had hoped for, but rather um, a military that's going to try to do tweaks and, and do just enough to pacify people's concerns, but not enough to lose any of the influence, both economic and, 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 and political that they have over the country. John, uh, how, how stable is Egypt right now? Uh, Depends what you're trying to do. I mean, as Nancy suggested, the people are really worried about the security situation. In some places, the security situation is a real problem. <clears throat> the economy is uncertain and likely to get worse before it gets better. Um, but as Nancy rightly said, the military not only remains in control, but the military has 94% approval ratings. It's really breathtaking. I think the military, th their goal is to sort of snip around the edges, uh, to not make any fundamental change. The military, I think, in their heart of hearts, would sort of like to return to, to 1990, uh, a less free market economy. The military is out of power, has its, its perks, uh, has its way to, to do patronage internally. So they're not interested in a bold new world, really. Um, and what continues to surprise me is that all these months after the protest started in Tahrir Square, we haven't seen really new political groupings, political organizations coming up. The, brother, the Muslim Brotherhood had a national organization and has a national organization. It's starting to splinter, but at least you have a sense that here's a bunch of people with a field operation and they have some sense of how you organize and how you set up uh, uh, a command chain. But the old parties haven't really gotten new wind in their sails. The new parties haven't figured out how to be a party. The National Democrat Democratic Party, which used to be the ruling party, remains completely on the ropes. There's nothing that's coming together, and we're looking at the potential of elections in three months, and there's really nothing to work from, and we don't even know what the rules of these new elections will be. And that, I think, is surprising, quite frankly, that, that after this, this time of incredible optimism and movement, that it hasn't really gelled into something else. The Egyptians don't know where they want to go. It makes it hard to help the Egyptians because they don't know what they want. Uh, and I think the Egyptians sort of need to take a 
collective breath, but they're still not sure where they're going. I think that creates a sense of instability and certainly has, has devastated uh, uh, foreign direct investment and domestic investment in Egypt, which makes the economic problems even worse. The impulse at the time of the election, should they take place in the fall, will be toward strengthening the social safety net, which is about more government employees, higher, higher salaries, and more subsidies, which is exactly what people in Washington would say is the worst thing you can do for Egypt's future. What are the things as these elections approach that we ought to be worried about, David? Well, we should be worried about, about, um, about, the, about the insecurity uh, in, the, in the streets and whether that will fuel a politics of uh, people calling for, for order. I think we should be concerned about um, intolerant uh, Muslim um, political trends. I don't, I don't want to say that that's where the Muslim Brotherhood is going because I, it's just been, I haven't been there in a couple months. Um, certainly in the, in the immediate period after the Tahrir Revolution, the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, people who were willing to speak to journalists like me um, said all the right things. Uh, you know, talk about the Turkish model, talk about uh, how the, our, th our threat to democracy has been overstated, et cetera, et cetera. I think one thing that, that um, I certainly didn't anticipate was the sudden visibility and power of the Salafist movement, um, even more radical theologically than the Muslim Brotherhood, um, uh, not armed, but a sort of passionately uh, retro uh, movement and, and you see a lot of people in the streets in Cairo. Just the only other thing I'd, I'd say, because this is the, what we all go back to and what I think the Arab world goes back to is the, is the spirit of those uh, weeks in Tahrir Square that made the revolution. I, I got there at the tail end, but I've never seen anything like it. Yeah, I'm sure Nancy, you know, would, would say the same thing. It, it you know, the, uh, when revolution is in the air, when you have a, a million plus people spontaneously in this, you know, self-organizing mass, making history and and, uh, and and being peaceful, being disciplined, uh, it was it was a transforming process for Egyptians and for I think the whole Arab world was just absolutely transfixed watching it. And people said, "We want this. We want this spirit. We want to take control of our lives and our countries in the same way." Uh, sadly, that you know that doesn't last forever. You and know, it was, and it was fundamentally a negative, right? It was a negative desire. We want to get rid of Hassan Mubarak and his there, son. And his son. Yeah. There never was a positive goal that had broad support in Egypt, be it democracy or anything else. I think basically what people wanted is better results. But Throw nobody, the bombs but, out, no, but nobody agreed on how to get those better results. And and one of the interesting things with some of these, these uh, kids who are active on Facebook, uh, Malcolm and Name and others, was um, this sense that we can do politics differently, we're going to post everything, you know, we're going to have a meeting, we're going to post the notes on our Facebook page, we're going to do everything by consensus. And what we've seen is that doesn't work. It's, you can't have everybody inside the tent. But how else do you do it? And as I, I think it's been surprising that all these months later, we haven't seen more of a coalescing around either different ideological trends, different strategies toward governance. Instead, it's everybody's all over the place. You know, one of the things, well, there were several places where they did not want to see uh, Mubarak and his son thrown out, and Saudi Arabia would be one, uh, and a couple of other uh, countries out there. I'd, I'd just like to go around the horn here, and uh, what what, how has this changed our relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia and, um, and with some of these other countries out there? Well, I think the, the, the feeling in the Gulf is we took a long time ally and we threw them under the bus. And they're angry about it. Mm -hmm. uh, the feeling in the Gulf is that Egypt is the center of gravity for the Arab world. And now Egypt is a smoking hole. And nobody knows what's going to happen. And they don't want to get involved until they have a better sense what's going to happen. So the Saudis have said we'll give $4 billion, but the Emiratis, I think, are holding off and others are holding off. Um, I think it's part of a broader trend, which I've seen over the last nine months, um, that people think this administration fundamentally doesn't get the way the world works, that they keep 
chasing enemies like Iran, uh, making ourselves look weaker. We keep getting bested in places like Lebanon and with the Palestinians, with Hamas, and, and in Iraq and all sorts of places. We keep losing. And this administration keeps losing. They don't understand that you have to project strength and you have to stand by your friends and you have to preserve the status quo. And the enthusiasm for Tahrir and Tunisia and everything else is a sign in their mind of the immaturity and naivete of the administration. And their response is that we can't rely on the United States in the same way, in addition to the US relationship, which they certainly can't abandon because there's not really an alternative. They want to sort of plaster on top of that, well, we'll expand the GCC, we'll talk about this, we'll do that, we'll try to reach out to the, to the uh, Chinese and others. And what you see is, I mean, sort of the trying to have a belt and suspenders at the same time, that they keep layering strategies. Sometimes they're contradictory, but they simply don't have the confidence in the judgment of the United States. Especially interesting, A, because they had so little confidence in the judgment of the Bush administration, and B, because they had so much hope for, for Barack Obama. And a lot of that has turned to bitter, bitter disappointment. You know, I, I wanted to get to this idea of Egypt and its inability to sort of coalesce around sort of some political parties. Because you, you, when you're on in the ground, you feel the, they're trying. There's certainly an effort, but it, it just it collapses in a way. And I think the one thing that's helped me in terms of thinking about what's happening in the region and the birth of the Arab Spring is I always equate it to 1968 in this country. You know, it was a whole generation of people, and I see it within my own family, people who, who thought that their parents had sort of failed them, that they, had, that they had gone along with the government far too long and didn't rise up enough, and they decided that they could do things better now. And so that's about as far as the thought process went. And that doesn't, and so, so they go to the streets and they have this revolution and then they say, we've done it. And it's just now that the ideas have started about what, what are we talking about post Mubarak. In a way, you can almost still feel the shock in Egypt that he's, still, that he's gone. You, you know, you talk to Egyptians, they're like, oh, we really did it. Who, who would have th thought, you know? You can still feel the, the surprise um, about what happened and yet the, the, the real world reality of all of it, it's, it's, you can feel it, it's still sinking in with people in a small ways. They don't go out the way they used to. Um, people are afraid in the streets now. They see it in the, in the plummeting tourism. I mean, you can go to the pyramids now and they're, they're virtually empty. Um, and they see it when they see these young parties starting up of young people all competing for the, for the voice of Egyptians and not, nothing quite capturing it. It was interesting, David mentioned the Salafis earlier and the rise of them, which has been shocking. The only thing that gives me hope is in Libya, you got the sense that these these sort of extreme secularists, if you want, and religious extremists of whatever persuasion on the other, that neither one can survive anymore in this new post-war period. They're both having to kind of find a new middle um, so that they can survive in, in this new political climate. And so my hope is that, that, that that'll mitigate some of the, the threats that we see in, in, in Salafists and for some people, the Muslim Brotherhood as well. The, the Salafis consistently pull in the low single digits. That's right. So, I mean, it's not about, to, it's not a, a hidden wave that I think is going to I think it's just the America. shock of them rising up as quickly as they did. And I, for people, who, for me it wasn't shocking because in Egypt you knew that there was, a, there was a percolating Salafist movement. But I think just seeing them all of a sudden have a voice was, was almost jarring. To let, me, let me just go back to this, uh, the view of, of the Saudis and how it's changed toward America. Does that make a difference to America? How do we deal with that? And well, there. Uh, Saudi Arabia has been the cornerstone of our uh, strategic uh, policy in, in the Middle East since, um, since 1945. And um, you think of all of the, uh, you know, hoops we've jumped through uh, to try to protect our, our Saudi ally, and, and, and now our Saudi ally is kind of walking the other way and, and thinking, gee, you know, maybe we'd be better off in, uh, with the, with the Chinese. Um, I think uh, that change is, is coming to Saudi Arabia and the Gulf, too. Um, we're on, we forget about it, and the Saudis are kind of the new, as they're like, they take, take it over from the United States as the status quo power, and they're kind of huffing and puffing. And, but, 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 but they're on the, on the, on the lip of, of a generational change. K King Abdullah is old. The, the brothers who would immediately succeed him are also old, and 
so you hear a lot of talk that what's ahead is, is, is something different in Saudi Arabia, some kind of prime ministerial role for um, somebody who may not be uh, in the line of succession, um, other, other changes in governance in Saudi Arabia. I find young Saudis are as internet savvy, as you know, focused on Twitter and the latest feeds uh, as any other friends in the Arab world. I think this movement of Saudi women to start driving, um, I, I'd love to know what Nancy thinks about that, but I think that's, pr that's pretty interesting. And that's the kind of thing that's hard to put back in a box once, you know, once people say, you know what, I'm going to drive, and my husband's going to, he's going with me, and we're, you know, go ahead, arrest us. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that catches on. Although we've had it before, and Saudi women were allowed to drive, I think, in the 70s, or at least up, up until the early 70s. So it's, Saudi Arabia, as you know, moves at its own pace, and that pace is often very slow. And there's a certain strategic incoherence to the way Saudi Arabia moves so that nobody feels like they've really lost irrevocably. The nature of Saudi change is it's two steps forward, one steps back, three steps sideways. That's the way the place moves. And in some ways, you know, it, it's the way people see the Senate as the saucer on which everything cools. That's the way the Saudi government sees its job. And I think the role of the king in Saudi Arabia in particular is not to be a player on the field, not to make the mistake the Shah made in Iran, that he had, the king has ideas and he tries to take everybody and he finds out that there's nobody following. And instead, the, the job of the king is kind of like being a, a crooked referee. And you want to throw a call every once in a while, and you know, there's a team you'd really prefer, but you're not playing, and everybody continues to look to you to authority. And if you lose that in Saudi Arabia, if the king forgets the fact that he's not a player on the field, and the king forgets the fact that everybody needs to compete and everybody needs to think they can win, then the king loses. You know, I think we'd be remiss in talking about U.S.-Saudi relations without mentioning Bahrain and the United States' relatively, relative silence on what's happening in Bahrain and, and, the, and the Saudi role in all that. I mean, we've seen now uh, the Bahrainis destroying Shia shrines, and that's been met with absolute silence by the United States and the continued arrests and, in some cases, abuse of, of the, the Shia population there. And the United States has really been reticent to, to get involved with that, one would argue, primarily because of Saudi Arabia. If, in the, I mean, we'll hear talk about the, the Fifth Fleet being headquartered there, but that Saudi pressure, that Saudi, the Saudi relationship with the Bahrainis certainly, certainly comes in the way well, I think the, the other thing is that the strategic goal is trying to get this, the Bahrainis to have uh, some reconciliation and dialogue. And the more we seem to be criticizing one side in favor of the other, we don't contribute to that dialogue. So, that, I mean, that, that's the way I see it, um, that, that what the administration thinks it's doing is it's trying to contribute to a national dialogue that will begin to heal these differences in Bahrain. You can argue either way whether, in fact, you can have a successful dialogue and whether the ruling, whether, the, you know, the, 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 the Sunni minority yeah. would actually agree to that. But as far as I understand, the assessment of the U.S. government is you can have that dialogue, and if the goal is to having the dialogue, it's not useful to keep poking a stick in the eye of one of the, one of the parties. I, I absolutely agree, but in, I, was, I spent some time in Bahrain, and I don't think the Bahrainis see it that way. They see the destruction of their shrines and the silence by the U.S. as an outrage, really, and it's, it's cost us a lot of, um, I think, credibility uh, in the streets of, streets of, of Bahrain and, and a feeling that we're, we're, we're placating, if you will. What's the, the most Saudis? dangerous place across that part of the world? <laughs> Yemen, it's tough, a, tough. Well, I'd you say know, I can't Syria, choose potential. between all my children, right? I love all my children equally. Um, What's the place we ought to I most be worried right. about right now? Uh, you know, I'd, I'd come back. I, I think Syria is is, um, is is strategically really important. I think if, if Assad goes in Syria, um, the consequences for Iran are very substantial. I think ir Iranians would look at this and would be emboldened by it. Uh, I think the consequences for Lebanon and for... Wait, if Assad goes, the Iranians would be emboldened? Iranian, the green movement in Iran, seeing a, a citizen movement topple Iran's only real ally in the, in the Arab world, I, I think that would have huge consequences. I think it would uh, create a crisis in Lebanon um, that would be a very complicated one because Hezbollah would be isolated. It would have to 
make a choice about whether without it, you know, without its its supply line, how was it, how would it operate? Uh, there's a new prime minister in Lebanon who I think is actually an interesting figure, uh, Najib Mikati, mm -hmm. who um, is trying to figure out how to play this hand. So that would be my nominee for for the most most dangerous and also also the most kind of interesting politically. John, what would you? I think? I think you have sort of two axes. One is the sort of number of deaths. And I think the other is importance to the United States, and they're different axes. So I think in some cases you could have, in Libya, you could have a tremendous number of deaths, but I think Libya is fundamentally uh, tactical for the United States. Egypt, I think much less possibility of, of a high civilian toll, but where Egypt comes out is tremendously important for the United States because, as I said, the sense. Uh, that Egypt is the center of gravity for the entire Arab world. I think Syria is probably somewhere in the middle on both. Uh, I think Syria is going to be much more drawn out than other places. I think that we talked about neighbors earlier. I think the Jordanians, if Jordan were to go, Jordan would be a tremendous problem for a lot of people because Jordan is so important to the Saudis and the Israelis and the United States. I think that gives them more security. I think we have to look at those two very different axes, and, and they're, not a, they're not the same at all. But Jordan's been the most proactive, wouldn't you say, of all the Arab countries that um, sort of letting, letting um, uh, general, general choice for, for, for the, for the, the, um, the, the ministers. I mean, Jordan has tried to sort of be proactive in their response to the people in a way that we didn't see in, in, in Egypt or, or Libya. I mean, everybody sort of dug their heels in, but King Abdullah has tried to sort of stay ahead of it, whether he's able to or not. I think Abdullah and, and Mohammed VI of Morocco have both tried to, to use their sort of kingly powers to say, okay, let me, let me try to propose some ideas. That's the advantage that, that kings have that presidents don't, because uh, presidents do have to be players on the field. Um, whether, you know, in either Morocco or Jordan over a 10 year time frame, is that going to be adequate? Are you really going to have genuine change? Because in many cases, in both Jordan and Morocco, we've heard a lot of these same promises a lot of That's times right. before, That's and we haven't seen them. Uh, so I, it's, I mean, it's, as I say, I think we got spoiled by Egypt and Tunisia. And we, we keep looking at the paper every day and say, OK, what happened today? And a lot of these things, you know, in terms of where's the loyalty of the military, I think those things take years to unfold, and I think we have years ahead of us. Does anybody have any questions in the audience? We have about 10 minutes. There's one right there. And I say we have about 10 minutes, so short, good short questions, very, right very, to the very point. Short, very short question. My name is Saeed Erekat from Al Quds Daily Newspaper. My question to Mr. David Ignatius You said that you're struck by the lack of enthusiasm for doing more in Libya. What could the administration do more? in Libya to change the situation. Could you re repeat that? He said, what, what should the administration do more what in should Libya? The administration what should we do more, more of in Libya, uh, more of in the Libya. administration? Well, and, and the next quick question is, how does this Arab Spring impact uh, Palestinian aspirations for a state? Thank you. Um, let me briefly answer the, the first question, then we'll all probably want to talk a little bit about the Palestinians. Um, the, the issue. Um, with Libya is whether the U.S. Sh should provide greater military assistance to the NATO coalition. There's been a request for, I think they're called A-10 uh, warthogs. Is that what they're called, John? There's yeah. some plane that, that NATO would like us to be, to be flying, and um, I just don't think that, that the White House wants to step up the level of its military commitment. There's a, there's a second issue, which is whether the U.S., um, should play a more active role in seeking to organize some process of discussion that could lead to a transitional government that would succeed uh, Gaddafi. Gaddafi would leave and this transition would come in. And I know that the administration is, is pondering that issue, but I don't, I don't think it yet is confident that it really has a message from the Gaddafi inner circle that's reliable. On, on the Palestinians, uh, we've, we've all been wondering what will happen when this spark of the, of the Arab Spring uh, catches, uh, 
with the Palestinians, uh, mass uh, nonviolent demonstrations by Palestinians uh, in the West Bank, in Israel itself, uh, among Israeli Arabs, uh, would be a, a very difficult new problem for the Israelis to deal with. Um, for the moment, all the attention on the Palestinian side seems to be focused on the UN uh, in September and the declaration of a state. Uh, why don't I stop there because I'd love to hear what Nancy and John think about that. On, on the Libya, I think the most practical, I think you're right, military, it'd make, it'd make a huge difference if there was more, if the U.S. once again resumed the lead militarily, which of course it relinquished just a few weeks into the operation. I think the most important thing they could do that would be politically palpable here is to get more involved in what, milita in military terms, the phase five, the post-Gaddafi period, in terms of working with training these TNC members because they're dentists and orthodontists and people who've never governed before in their lives and they may find themselves, as John pointed out, very suddenly in charge of this country. And I think having an active phase five program going, it doesn't have to be public, but really working with these guys and preparing them for governing the whole country, for transitioning in some places, reconciliation, some would argue, in the West with some, with frankly, some pro-Gaddafi forces that are still there, reconciling the friction that's, the unspoken friction between the West and the East. I think those are all things that they can do politi politically um, without, without getting the military involved because they, they don't seem to have the, the, the appetite to do it. I, I, I'm, I'm at something of a loss to understand what the military goals are, uh, and therefore I can't understand what we do more militarily. I think that ultimately, as, as you suggest, the, the important outcome is the political outcome. And I think how you get the political outcome depends partly on the diplomacy now and partly on what you do for the 30 days after there's no longer Muammar Gaddafi in control. And I think we haven't thought nearly enough individually and collectively with our allies to figure out how that gets handled and how we influence it in a positive way. In terms of what effect the Arab Spring has on, on the Palestinians, as David rightly points out, there is this, this huge attention toward uh, the UN vote in September. I think the other, the other key driver of uncertainty is how's the Arab Spring turned out in other places? If it seems to turn out really well, that obviously starts inspiring people to say, that's what we need more of here. If it turns out really poorly, people say the last thing we need is more of that here. And I think that, that you know, that's why Egypt ends up being important. I think that's ultimately where Tunisia's real weight in the region comes in, is if Tunisia really figures out how to have a real different constitution, and if whatever happens in Tunisia is really different from the last transition from Bourguiba to Ben Ali, and I commend to you the New York Times article when Ben Ali came in, 22 years ago about what a reformer he was and he was opening up and he was getting rid of all the authoritarian you know, restrictions of, of Bourguiba and everything else, and it didn't play out that way. But if the Tunisians can figure out a way or if the Egyptians can figure out a way, I think that has a tremendous impact on the region. If either or both of those really start going south, I think you have still a process of change, but it's a very different process, it's a very different impact on the Palestinians than it otherwise would. Let's try to squeeze in a couple more. Right here. You, sir. Front row. Oh. Thank you very much. Um, this is great, but I want to turn the question to how the media has covered this, the entire story. I mean, one of the things that I noticed seems to me that if the question that hasn't been covered in the media is, how is it that we are friends to these dictators who are detested by their people? Because we've cultivated them for a long time, and I would have thought this would be an, um, uh, an opportunity for the media to be talking to the American people. How did we get into bed with these guys who their people hate, and is it good for us? And I've seen it also a lot in Sub-Saharan Africa. So my question is, how is it that that story doesn't get told? Well, I'm. I'm not sure I'd agree, since I'm part of the media here, I, <laughs> that I would agree with the premise of your question. I mean, hasn't that been a big part of the discussion? And, and hadn't it been part of the discussion for a long, long time? I mean, maybe I'm, I'm wrong about that, but that well, would be my answer. You know, the pro the, there's a very practical problem going on. With the, there aren't enough of us. You know, you, you, I mean, I jumped from Bahrain to Egypt to Libya 
And every day I didn't know what country I was going to end up in because there was a new revolution. I mean, there's just practically not <laughs> enough of us to cover all these uprisings and, and, and all with the understanding and the, and the nuance of the country. So you found yourself hopping. And, and sometimes with not enough, you know, so focused on the immediate sort of the violence and, but not enough time to spend on the real nation building effort that ultimately becomes so critical. And that's just a function of our shrinking institution and, and this uh, up against this more complex story. I can tell you militarily in Libya was the, I've, I've been in Iraq, Afghanistan. This is militarily the hardest story I've ever covered in my life because it's a lot like Bosnia. There are no front, there's, you know, at least in Iraq, there was some semblance of a safe place you could go to. That doesn't exist in Libya. You would go to front lines and they would collapse around you in a matter of, of minutes. And what constituted a, a front line and what constituted a rebel? Gaddafi forces in urban areas would use sniper fire against their people and in, in more, um, open areas, we, we, we saw the air campaign and then and huge artillery. And sometimes we journalists would find ourselves the last people left on the front line. Well, that's not good, you know. <laughs> so it was very hard to cover as, as a military story, which is, you know, as I think about these things, because warfare has changed. It's, you've got the state acting, using sort of insurgency tactics and, the, and this nascent insurgency using insurgent tactics. And there were days I thought, you know, we're either, we're either going to get hurt by sniper fire from Gaddafi's forces or a rebel shooting himself and taking me out with him on, on the rebel side because they, they just didn't know what they were doing. It was incredibly challenging militarily. I, I found it, I mean, I've, I've never stood at a front line and been like, huh, I'm the last one here, you know. I mean, I just, I've never had that happen. And, 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 and watching them, these rebels try to figure out how, how to fight. It made it very hard as a journalist to, to figure out who was up, who was down. And on top of that, there, as, as John pointed out, there is no military strategy. I mean, even in Misrata, this is the third biggest city, we've seen major violence there. I don't understand tactically how winning Misrata gets you closer to Tripoli. I understand it's in the West and it's a psychological win, but I don't understand how taking that city then advances you to Tripoli because you've got two, you've got cities around it that are, that are secure. Um, under Gaddafi forces. So I think militarily it's the hardest story I've, I've ever encountered. Another question? Right there. Uh, thanks. You're I welcome. would agree with uh, the chair in his comment, and I think it raises the reverse question. Why was the media so uncritically supportive of the revolution in Egypt? Why does it criticize itself only for not supporting the revolutions enough, being behind the curve? And the same about its criticism of the United States government. Why has there been an almost nonstop narrative of criticism of the American government for having friends who are not perfect, as if anyone in the region is perfect? Uh, and particularly to David Ignatius as well as to the chair, it seems to me that there is a real problem of the media's lack of perspective and common sense in this revolution. I think you were very honest in acknowledging that things have turned out not as nice in Egypt as you expected, why did journalists get so swept up in the revolution? Why did they identify with it so much as to lose their critical sense? Why was there an almost nonstop smear of people who raised concern about the mother Muslim Brotherhood, calling them agents of Mubarak's fear-mongering? And now we have to look back and ask, is there really a problem there that we should have been paying attention to? Uh, why did people lose their critical common sense? Well, I, I'm not sure. Uh, once again, that uh, that the media was taking sides here. It seems to me like we were pointing the cameras at people who were marching out into the square. Uh, I, I think we were reflecting what we saw, which is basically what we do, and I think is the most important part of what we do. I mean, we laid it out there so people could see, but you know, obviously, people were finding about this, finding out about this in many different ways besides just the the conventional media. I mean, a lot of this news spread. Uh, uh, through, through the uh, social media. So I'm not sure we did all that bad a job. I think basically that we did what we were supposed to do. We covered this story. And, uh, you know, we've been debating since back in the Nixon administration uh, why we're on one side or the other. And I must say, I think the arguments on both sides have uh, been pretty well covered over the David, would you like to? Well, uh, let me respond. I, I think it's a, I think it's a, a, a reasonable question. Um, I think that there was um, a kind of uh, romance to the Tahrir Square events that we picked up and, and uh, you know, we picked it up on, 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 on the streets and then amplified it 
uh, around the world. I'd have to say that, in a sense, our job in that situation is just to hold a microphone. And, I mean, what, what, what's transforming isn't what I write. It's, it's you're seeing the pictures and feeling the intensity of what's going on. I, I always feel it's important to underline that, that the position that we take matters less than you know, the power of the events themselves. And when you have people day after day out there risking their lives, um, demanding freedom, uh, we respond as human beings, whether we're Americans or, or, or Arabs. I mean, there just was a human response to that. Um, I think the question you ask about whether we let ourselves get talked into the idea that the Muslim Brotherhood was a benign organization whose, whose threat had been wildly overstated in the past by Mubarak in an attempt to cling to power, I think that's a reasonable question. Um, you know, I, I made some effort um, to, to, to look into that, um, but I, I have to be honest, it was quick. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I certainly noted the, the, the issue, um, but I think that, that deserves a lot more scrutiny now. I, I think, you know, the friends of, uh, you know, the, our job, we're not the friends of anybody except our readers and viewers, but I mean, our job is to, to get to the bottom of what are their intentions? Who are these people? What, what are the, where do they want to go? Um, uh, what do they think about, about Israel and peace with Israel? So I, I, think, I think the question is, is a reasonable one. Yeah. Okay, one more question. Back there. Hi. Uh, isn't it possible that if, uh, if the administration came out really strongly and criticized human rights violations of Palestinians by Israel and criticized human rights violations that are going on in Bahrain, um, that that would shorten the lifespan of the regime in Iran, which is always saying that we're hypocritical when we talk about human rights, it's just our interests we're disguising. Um, wouldn't that be a good way to attack Iran and shorten the lifespan of, of that regime to show that actually this country has a sincere commitment to human rights, that it's not just a bargaining chip? Who'd like to? Um... Well, I guess if we could get that I'll, message into I'll, Iran, it might have well, some of an impact. You know, I, I, I honestly think it's, it's harder to affect the domestic politics of Iran than we would like to be the case, yeah. right? I mean, Iranians are worried about what? They're worried about the price of bread. They're worried about jobs. They're worried about the price of gas. They're worried about uh, where they can travel. I mean, the, the Iranians have a whole bunch of you know, how they can dress, what's happening to the, to the women in their family. I mean, they have a whole bunch of concerns. And while the trope of the regime is death to America, I'm not sure that we loom as large in ordinary Iranians' lives as, as you know, the sort of, if we just talked about human rights, we could weaken the regime. I think that the key issues that will shape stability in Iran are two. One is the economy, which is heavily tied to oil prices. Every time the price of oil goes up a dollar, it's $600 million in their pocket, and oil prices are up. So it's one issue. And the second is elite cohesion, and I think particularly whether you have the clerical establishment continuing to support the government of Iran. And that is getting to be a more interesting story. I think those are the two key issues. I think where the U.S. is, human rights, I think those are kind of marginal issues, and they might be able to play a role at some point when things get in play. But I think the two things to look at are two things, one of which we have very little control over, the other which we have almost no control over, which is energy prices and, and this elite cohesion problem. Well, folks, I'm sorry, but our time's run out. Thank you very much. CSIS and PC. Thank you. They were really quiet. No cost.